Good morning and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Ben Ormsby and I'm the Yorkshire editor of the businessdesk.com. Uh, today's session is entitled The Renaissance of Towns as in, and is in partnership with Bev and Britain. I think the last 12 months have shown businesses, well, have seen businesses have to make seismic changes as they looked to manage the impact of the COVID-19 crisis. One of those significant changes has been in the way people work and their work in working practices. So as the dust settles on hopefully the na last national lockdown, I don't want to jinx anything, uh, and continues to move forward, it's clear that new hybrid working practices are, well, here to stay. So over the next 45 minutes, alongside the expert panel you can see before me, uh, we're going to look at what those changes mean for our towns and see if they can be a catalyst for them to reinvent themselves and drive future growth in their economies. But before I get on to uh, or ask the panel to introduce themselves, please feel free to ask any questions using the Q&A button that is at the bottom of your screen and I will put them to the panel throughout the session. So let's get started. Um, if the panel can introduce themselves one by one and ask the f and answer the following question uh, about what opportunities they see for towns as we emerge from lockdown. I'm going to start with Lyndon, if that's okay. Hi, uh, my name's Lyndon Campbell. I'm a partner at Bevan Britain in the Leeds office, specialising in commercial property. Um, in terms of how I see towns um, changing post-COVID, I think with the sort of amount of people that have been and will remain working at home uh, in, in the future, that there'll be a bit of a shift in terms of um, the type of facilities that most towns offer and, and need to offer going forwards with the, the vast number of people which will be mo working locally um, to provide services that they need that they may ordinarily have um, required if of working in a city centre. Fantastic. Uh, same question to you, Nikki. Hi, um, I'm Nikki Chance Thompson. I'm the Chief Executive of the Peace Hall over in Halifax. Um, and I think the opportunity for towns is that we have this moment in time to really innovate how we how we how we use towns, how we access towns, the role of towns with cities. Cities have tended to dominate financially. Um, and prior to the pandemic, towns were really fighting to re-establish themselves. And what we've seen during the course of the pandemic is people learning to appreciate towns and, and where they live. Um, so for me, I think we have a really great opportunity, a moment to recast how we, how we plan for towns, how we plan for cities, and ensure that we spread the wealth um, across towns from cities, um, and just ensure that people can work in ways which, which are much more attractive and much more sustainable. Um, you know, just because we did it before doesn't mean we have to do it again. So what does that kind of hybrid model look like going forward so that we can ensure that people are not having to deal with long commutes, struggles with childcare? Let, let's take this time to really recast how we work and how we live um, so that each area has the opportunity to grow. Fantastic. Uh, same question to you, Richard. Oh, oh you're just on mute. Uh, as if I'm the first one to do that. <laughs> <laughs> There's always one. There's always one. <laughs> I'm Richard Spatman, um, one of the development directors for CNC. Um, so across a, a couple of different projects within our portfolio. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question and absolutely echo the, the comments already ma been made. Something that we obviously need to not kind of get uh, too ahead of ourselves, I suppose, in trying to analyse kind of the, the long term impact of what, what COVID's brought around over the last sort of 12, 18 months. But certainly one of the kind of shorter term trends we're starting to see is, and it was starting to be noticed before the pandemic, but um, as prices grow in city centres, people are looking potentially at what they can get uh, for their money in sort of some of the commuter towns. Some of the things I'm, I'm working on project specifically Stockport at the moment. Yeah, that's it's a nine minute commute into Manchester city centre. So you you've got almost comparable commutes from from various places on the tram, but you'll get a, a bit more space out in Stockport than you would in a city centre for a similar price. So that's one of the the, the key things that we've started to see coming out of the pandemic. Fantastic. Uh, same question to you, Chris. Hi, Chris Dunworth, Head of Service for Business Doncaster. We are the Economic uh, D Development Regeneration Arm of Doncaster Council. Um, I'm sat at home in my conservatory, where I've done for the last 12 months. Complete change in how we work. Every, every day it was a, a commute into town. And for us, Doncaster Council was the biggest employer in the town centre. Now, if we go to hybrid working, how does that affect the town centre? 
less, less, less people in, less shopping. So the town centres have got to change. Uh, we also are looking at a, more of a leisure destination for the town centre and, and I'm changing hours. Um, the nine till five is over for us. It's got to be after after work and it, um, get people back into town after work to get that footfall and them numbers back. And we do quite a lot of work around converting the town, not only to um, residential development, but to be more of a leisure destination for people to come in and enjoy out of hours. Uh, and that will happen across all towns across England, that I would assume, as, as we move forward. Fantastic. And lastly, uh, to you, Dali. Uh, thanks, Ben. Um, my name's Dali, Dali Poor. I'm also a partner at Trevor Britain in the planning department, uh, specialising in, in, in a wide range of uh, uh, planning matters. Um, in terms of this question, I mean, I think um, hybrid working, I mean, I'm putting my planning hat on here, is that I don't think it directly relates to the hybrid working practices, but there are there's positive opportunity regarding ground planning, which will have an impact on towns, whether there are good impacts or bad impacts, um, or sort of that will be a matter of time. But um, there have been a number of planning changes that came into force last year, uh, also proposed, uh, namely for the youth classes uh, and permitted development rights. So, um, you know, whether there's considered an opportunity in the context of reventing towns really depends on what side of the fence um, one sits on. So, for example, developers will have a different view, say, to local authorities. Um, you know, but before touching upon those changes, it's probably actually to put it in context and look at the look at the drivers behind the changes. You know, and the driver in the planning in the planning world in the context is basically repurposing of buildings on the high street, of um, allowing um, uses, diversifying uses on the high street, and have, allowing businesses to um, to be more flexible, to adapt, uh, meet the um, changing demand, you know, um, support high streets by allowing empty space to be quickly repurposed, um, you know, where it no longer serves the purpose, and support housing delivery and, and, and economic recovery. Um, so they're the drivers around, around the cha changes uh, uh, around within planning and um, in, in connection with, with the town. Um, so you've got changes to use classes. So we now have a um, uh, use class E, which is um, effectively a new use class that came into force in September last year. It's generally now, um, uh, it brackets now a wide variety of uses within the same use class. So anything from a bank to a bowling alley now basically falls within uh, a class E. So generally, you know, if an existing and proposed use then falls within um, that class, you essentially don't need planning permission. But there's a number of um, permitted development rights as well. Each of the permitted development rights generally comes with limitations, exclusions. Um, it will require prior approval. They have you know, height restrictions and all the rest of it. But as a key factor is the drivers behind this is that it's the economic it's, it's growth around um, delivering more housing, demolition, rebuilding, vacant and redundant um, um, spaces. Um, to deliver more homes, um, upward um, development, building more housing on, on top of terraces, shops, etc. And then the new um, permitted development right, which comes into force in August this year, is about the, the ability to change a uh, use within Class E um, to C3, which is um, again housing, again subject to limitations and, and all the rest of it. So lots of lots of changes, um, you know lots of opportunities so although the changes on the face of it represents opportunities uh, and potentially addresses the i would say the immediate need or the drivers um the question would be whether really the changes will undermine sort of high streets and town centers in the long term you know given the lack of control um over the control of the form of development like quality for homes what does this mean for place making you know lots of active frontages on high streets um you know time will tell whether these are positive in the long term sorry i know that's a long-winded response to that question but um uh, you know there's so much in the planning uh, really you know that there's so much to talk about but yes in response to your question i don't think it's directly sort of um you know but you'll have it it will have an impact that 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 is that is fine to be fair when it comes to planning and and, and planning law in particular i always find it's better to be a have a thorough Thorough answer than, than a half baked one. So, but we've actually had our first question already. So, Barry has asked, um, and this one might sort of lead on to you, Richard. I was going to go to you after after Dali anyway and ask you what you think of the changes in planning from a developer's perspective. But 
what are we going to do with the very large shops in town centres for which there will be very limited demand in the future? And how do we overcome the resistance to change, which apparently planners and local authorities have? Um, so, Richard, I'm going to throw that on to you. Yeah, thanks. I saw it come up, actually. I was thinking I would quite like to give that one an answer. <laughs> we're, um, we're actually working with a number of local authorities at the moment. And I have to say, in answer to sort of the second part of the question, I think the local authorities, uh, and not, not generally across the UK, but definitely the ones that we're working with, um, share the same visions that we do for the town and city centres now. There is a, um, a definite ambition for a lot of local authorities to step up the game of, uh, of town centres. Um, and I think with some of the investments that are coming through and support for that development now, that is definitely starting to come to the forefront. Um, as an example, you know, Stockport and Rochdale at the moment, we're working with the councils. So with Rochdale, we're working on the Station Approach Gateway, one of the sites or first site for Station Approach Gateway, which is also part of a wider collaboration um, with all with the like with the rail stations of Greater Manchester. So um, they absolutely have an aspiration now to be providing um, some some new sort of benchmarking schemes that kind of hopefully will attract not only new people to the town but retain people within the towns as well. Um, so I think that was a definitely it's definitely changing for the better from that point of view. Apologies, the question's gone and I can't remember. Uh, so uh, yeah, it was, what what are we going to do with the large shops in town centres? Yeah, so demand. Yeah, in, again, really interesting question. And I'm seeing all sorts of things kind of popping up across uh, across various different town centres. Um, again, sorry to plug Rochdale uh, again, but um, as an example there, that's part of a regeneration of um, a, a retail park in Rochdale Town Centre. So one of the key things in order to kind of save a lot of these town centres, there, there's two parts to the question, I suppose. One is what do we do with the existing larger shops? Those that can't, that are part of you know heritage buildings and things that we can't get rid of we'll, we'll have to find alternative uses for some of those at the minute we're seeing a lot of um sort of co-working coffee shop type spaces popping up a, a very popular one at the moment as well is kind of produce and food halls um, which pop in the town centers which are all kind of great ways to bring people back into the town center and our sort of retail side of things is, is starting to fall away but certainly our approach to it where we've got a site that uh we don't have those limitations we do see it as in order to, to bring life back into town centres, we need to be rethinking proportions. So uh, I personally don't think there's a place at the moment right in town centres for larger larger commercial units, apart from some of those ones we've just been talking about. So what we're trying to do is maybe repurpose that and ensure that we're putting the right level of residential offering back as well as an appropriate amount of commercial spaces. So one of the things we keep getting asked, especially when we're working in town centres, is why are we putting more commercial areas back in when there's already an abundance of commercial spaces? And, and very often it is because they're either really large or they're really small fitting into kind of existing buildings. And so, again, it's about that appropriate kind of regeneration and provision being put back in um, and that sometimes is larger sometimes smaller uh, but definitely think that where we're looking at kind of town centre retail parks do seem to be struggling and so actually just a repurposing of the site seems to be a good way forward. Just off the back of that obviously Dali gave us the, the overview of, of the changes to planning I guess how how reassuring is it putting in commercial units that you know you can almost chop and change whether they're a shop or they're a bank or they're a bowling alley to use the uh, is the example or you know or office space in that sense how reassuring is that from the developer's perspective very much so especially at the moment i mean typically you know, with, with some of the larger schemes we work on they can be anywhere from you know two or three to five years from inception through to completion they're, they're long-term projects and you know if you were to stand three even three years back and say what's the next three years going to look like i don't think anyone would have told you we would be having a pandemic that's going to throw a spanner in the works so Having that flexibility, hopefully we won't have another one to try and uh, to try and navigate. But having that flexibility is great, and actually, what it also allows us to do is that public engagement piece is a lot better. So, if we're not restricted to coming up with a definitive kind of solution right at the point of submitting our planning application and then going through all the pain, which planners feel as well with you know reapplications and various of those applications, then it allows us to kind of also future-proof the, the design of the building and engage with all the local community all the way through to make sure that when we open the doors to those units, it's what the demographic and what that community actually want to see. 
as so part of our public consultations at the moment, which has come out of, out of COVID, we're, we've been able to kind of rethink how we do it. And one of the questions, one of the things we do is uh, we'll send out like a, a, a free reply questionnaire to, to sort of four or 5,000 local businesses, depending on where it is, um, and homes, and ask people, what is it you want to see for the site? And actually you get such a broad range it would be wrong to make that decision now so that flexibility allows us to kind of keep addressing that and we will do all the way through as we get closer towards the end we'll, we'll still be engaging with local community groups and, and local residents to understand what is it you want to see there's no point in us coming up with some great idea of what we think would be really suitable and then no one goes because actually we didn't talk to the local people of what they what they were going to want to see there so yeah definitely a, a welcome change and, and helps with the, the flexibility Chris, I guess, you know, you touched on it at the start that Doncaster's having to rethink what what it is, Doncaster Town Centre, uh, and trying to be more of that leisure destination. Do you, are you seeing seeing opportunities then through that? Are you seeing demand from, from leisure operators or is it, or has the, the pandemic stifled it? It's demand that we're having to chase, actually. Um, we, three years ago, we we lost the old, we lost Debenhams, as, as every town city lost Debenhams. We managed to replace it with a... Um, uh, an online uh, a leisure centre, leisure type use, um, trampoline, etc. Unfortunately, the pandemic has really hit them hard as well because they've been shut most of the time. So we're trying to retain them now as well. We just lost Debenhams, which the Debenhams unit is, is in our biggest indoor shopping centre. And at the moment, we're scouring the market for opportunities for that one, but it's unlikely that anything will come forward for a footprint of that size. So we are working with um, the shopping centre owners and other owners looking at possible residential conversions uh i i'm i've got um, just as big a concern as well not just retail but uh financial services uh the banking sectors increasingly moving online and i i, I streets full of high street banks with massive footprints um so what we're going to do with them in time again it looks like it'll be a residential conversion uh, and there's another question about luxury time departments the banks are ideal for conversion to luxury flat, uh, apartments if we can get a developer willing to take on uh, and um, actually take the gamble to do that. And I think there will be demand there, but we're having to reinvent ourselves as a leisure destination. The council's put quite a lot of money in the last two years pre uh, COVID, but it's come to fruition during COVID. We've now got a, a new cinema scheme that uh, the council owned, but which is um, subcontracted out to a private sector cinema operator. We've we opened our new Doncaster uh, Library Museum and Art Centre a couple of weeks ago, uh, just in, in, in case and try and get footfall back in the town centre. So we as a council are leading the way in uh, changing uses and, and making it into a leisure destination, but we need developers to work alongside and come with the interesting, unique ideas for us to help us do it, because we have a large footprint of, of, of retail facilities which we need to lose somewhere, uh, and conversion to residential or meantime uses, um, leisure uses, is the way to go. Um, well, Lyndon, I'm going to throw the question that actually Chris sort of gave a bit of an answer to at you as well. Uh, do you think that luxury retirement apartments are going to be something that is seen as a more attractive investment? For developers and, and and investors looking to move in, you know, I, I, there might not be an answer. You might not know it, but you know, we've seen. I know when we spoke last year at the very start of the pandemic, the answer was the investments in beds and sheds because everyone's using online shopping and everyone need, suddenly is where where they want to live. So, do you think that retirement living and retirement luxury end of that market could be an interesting opportunity for town? Oh, oh you're muted again. There we go. So, Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think potentially it could be, but I think the you know the towns and the cities have got to get the right balance. It's all well and good having um, residential accommodation for people in these areas, but they've got to have the right amenities around them. So you know there's got to be a balance in terms of you know residentials throughout what what those residential occupiers need: hospitality, healthcare, you know retail, um, education. So you know it's. It's all well and good developing them, but you've got to have a people that want to live there and have the amenities around there for them. So, yeah, uh, g given the right balance, it, it could be quite a buoyant market. F fantastic. Uh, Nikki, there's a question that almost feels like it's tailored to the piece all here. So high streets had become uh, fairly identical across the UK. You know, you could walk into any and find, I was going to show my age and say a Woolworths, but, uh, you know, a Debenhams, an M&S, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but obviously costs are then being prohibited to smaller schemes. 
the Peace Hall, which obviously reopened in 2017, seems to have revitalised Halifax's town centre by doing something a little bit different and a bit authentic, a bit more authentic perhaps for the town. Do you want to just tell a little bit more about that? Sure, I mean, for those of you that um, don't know the Peace Hall, haven't visited yet, it's um, a Grade 1 listed building. It's the last remaining Georgian Cloth Hall in the world, and it's called Peace because uh, the traders traded pieces of cloth here back prior to the Industrial Revolution. And the Peace Hall really is a good example of how a building has kind of reinvented itself to suit the times. It started trading cloth uh, when the Industrial Revolution came along. It then became an event space uh, before becoming a wholesale market and then a retail market. And then it kind of lost its way a bit uh, for a couple of decades. Um, and the plan for the regeneration of the Peace Hall or transformation of the Peace Hall was to regenerate the town centre uh, by taking this really beautiful, underutilised, quite neglected building and transforming it into a really important retail hospitality space, really. Um, but also puts on some great events. We've got Niall Rogers here next year. Um, we had Elbow play here in 2019. Um, and going back to Chris's point, I think, I think he's absolutely spot on. I think people are now looking for experiences. Um, they want to shop and eat and hang out in a beautiful historic building. Um, certainly, as we, as we reopened when we could, or we opened and closed quite a lot during the course of lockdown as with, under different tier restrictions. Um, what we found was that people felt that the Peace Hall was a bit of an oasis and a sanctuary for them, um, just to escape really, not only the four walls that they'd been in for a long time, but, but really just to experience the things in life that they'd missed out on during lockdown. And I've seen the town um, be used more as a result. Um, what I'm seeing is a rise of independent traders. Um, we've actually got um, Holly Tucker, who founded Not On The High Street, visiting us today to have a look at our independent trader mix here. Um, we're seeing that people want things that are a little bit different. Um, and it's really sad to see established brands like Debenhams and so on, Woolworths, I remember when Woolworths closed too, Ben, um, go but but that this has happened since the beginning of time consumers change their mind about how they want to shop and I think that the rise of leisure the rise of improved of improved housing is an important one that we just need to think about and I'm just minded that I was on the train with the chairman of Tesco a few years ago prior to the pandemic and he was telling me that the shed was dead as he called it you know the big uh, supermarkets that they built in Amersham in other places across the country Consumers were already dropping off that model long before the pandemic hit. Um, so we were already changing our minds some time ago, particularly with the, the development of online. So I think the challenge is going to be how a bit like the Peace Hall, which is we've got kind of four walls of great shops, great hospitality and great events. How do we replicate that in our town centres? How do we create great homes for people in town centres and encourage them um, to perhaps consider living in the town because of the great things it has to offer. But as Lyndon said, there does have to be an offer. Otherwise, you just end up with lots of houses without anything, the social infrastructure that kind of brings people together. Um, you know, we've seen that happen on council estates where there was a lot of social infrastructure along with the, along with the buildings. And when that social infrastructure was removed, we started to see problems occurring on housing estates and so on because there was nothing for people to do essentially. So I think it's how, as we build, it's, you know, let's go back to the community. You know, we, we've, we've kind of found the sense of community during lockdown, certainly in the town that I live in, we've all rediscovered each other, we're all speaking to each other, we're visiting shops together, we're having conversations, albeit socially distanced or behind masks, but, you know, I can't remember the last time that I, I had a conversation with my neighbour. And with that kind of revitalisation of community, whether it's in cities or in towns, let's think about what the community want. And I think the best way to do that is to actually go and speak to them um, and not do regeneration to them, but do it with them. And I think that that's going to be key for me. Uh, if, if we're going to get the right things, we need the physical infrastructure, absolutely. But we do need that social infrastructure to support it. And that that requires us to really be attuned to the communities that we serve. And I, can I just add there, I think that that's already happening to some extent in some areas. I mean, you're already seeing sort of, you know, suburban areas where 
new businesses are opening and it is you know it's those coffee shops at delhi sandwich shops yeah. which are which are pretty much opening up to serve a lot of the people that are working at home because there's more of a footfall absolutely and I, I guess that leads me on to what what do you think that the towns that, that our towns perhaps need to do to encourage that or you, you said it, it's already happening is there more that can be done to encourage it is them do we need different forms of support or 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 what else? And that might be a very open-ended question. I guess I'm going to, I'll throw it to Chris first because he's he's talking to businesses looking to come to Doncaster. Can you just repeat that, Ben? Uh, so Lyndon, Lyndon mentioned that obviously businesses are already like popping up and sprouting up that are looking to service people who are now starting to work remotely. Um, yes. so it's delis or, or coffee shops and things. Um, do you think more support needs to be done to help bring them into the town centres or is, is enough there already, would you say, from your experience? No, I, th I think we're, we're seeing um, in interest from our small type uh, independents wanting to come in. And, and we, we created a street a couple of years ago, um, uh, an old street that was many, many voids. And we bought a couple of properties as a council, start, kick-started it off. And that street's full now of independent businesses. So we, we're starting to change. We've, we've, we want to see more of it. And we, we've done our own economic recovery grant in Doncaster to see businesses come in. And part of that recovery grant is about uh, diversification and test trading to give them a start up in terms of filling some R&T units and, and we'll pick up the, the, the rent for the first six months. And, and that's starting to see applications come forward now. So we're trying our best to get people in. One of the issues we've got, and I think um, it's been mentioned in one of the questions is um, not losing ground for or retail spaces. Doncaster is a historic market town. Uh, it was a market town and, and, and a retail destination well before out of town supermarkets and out of town places like Meadowall, etc. So we've got a massive, vast footprint of retail spaces, a lot of which it will be impossible to fill. So we've got to look at down, um, uh, ground floor re, uh, conversions to residential and art space and etc. Uh, we, we just launched a, an art gallery on one of the streets, which has gone down really well. Uh, and that's got ground space and, and three floors and, and people are flocking to that one. So, so yeah, we are seeing demand. We, we're sort of uh, helping the demand by putting a grant out there, but independent businesses is the way to go away from uh, the big multinationals. Uh, and there is demand out there and people want to do it. And, yeah. I'm, I, and just to add to that, I, I just uh, uh, Doncaster Youth Market uh, last week and we had quite a lot of young traders who were, who were seeing um, self-employment is the way to go. And they're looking for cheap deals or on property and give me a chance to go in a retail you want on the market stall. So I think there is demand. I think it's the young people driving some of that demand. And I think we're, we're talking here about the sort of renaissance of the towns and cities, but it, actually, you know, it was almost a resurgence of independent retailers. You know, they're coming back and, you know, they're, they're doing well because they're serving local people and there's more people, more local footfall serving those businesses. And they've had to re reinvent themselves to some extent you know if you look at social media i look around me you know the, the small businesses they're all on facebook you know doing stuff out there to, to get their name out doing online shopping so it's it is almost like a resurgence of independent retailer I think, I, yeah go on carry on carry on i'll be quiet. yeah i i no, i i would agree i think i think there's more that we need to do um and uh, I, th I think that Richard touched on this. It's about having that agility to adapt um, and stop kind of doing these sort of plug and play responses to planning that we did before or, or regeneration that we did before. And kind of what the pandemic has done is it's created that space that has enabled us to react to consumer need um, and, and react to consumer demand in a way in which we couldn't really do before because there were lots of decision making processes and things went at a very kind of glacial speed. And I think as we go forward, you know, the structures around decision making need to be much more agile. Um, and I think that it sounds like some of the new planning regulations are, are encouraging that, but I, I, would, I would kind of caution, let's, let's work with communities and not, and not do it to them. Um, let's hear what the type of things that people need. So as we, we are actually thinking about that mix of, of the town or that mix for the city, that narrative for the area, that the communities really feel that they're owning that narrative because you know not only will they buy into any of those developments, but they might actually be some of the emerging developers of the future. 
and and just to echo uh, Nikki's comment about plug and play, it is very much like that. I mean, one of the things is great concept, you know, to be way to work in the communities, and one of the critics um, have been are saying that one of the critics uh, the criticisms of the changes of the planning is the fact that there's lack of community involvement, and that's mm -hmm. very much so. It is you know plug and play is probably the right word um, because. Um, there is there, there isn't that there is lack of communication a lack of community engagement therefore lack of control and therefore you know then you talk about infrastructure going back to Nikki's original comment about you know where where does the infrastructure fit in fit in all this so um, yeah completely agree but that leads me on to an, to another question for or two questions really from the audience I guess one of them is how can town centres balance the climate change agenda with affordable accessibility so you know they're they're looking at you know cost for rail rail fares into into town centres or into city centres can be quite prohibitive to, to both elderly or young people. But also is there an unmet demand for, for urban parks in towns? And is there that is that therefore an answer to both meeting the climate agenda and delivering a space that is perhaps usable? Uh, Richard, I can see you nodding so I'm gonna throw yeah. it. Sorry, no, I was looking at this as well. I, I, I'm quite keen on these because actually I think everything that's been said by everybody already goes to some way to kind of answering those questions anyway which it essentially is it's all about kind of careful curation mm -hmm. it's making sure that we're listening to what people want we're providing those amenities locally so actually I see the point there was relation to Leeds city centre that's the same problem across all city centres and commuting in from surrounding towns <clears throat> if you put the right amenity and the right provision within the towns themselves actually the amount of commuting then is is less than what well, is, is reduced certainly from a social side of things, but for, from a work point of view, we're already seeing kind of people working from home a lot more. So actually you can re, you can improve on, on those those issues by actually just providing things a lot more locally. And it's it's something that I have a real bugbear for when I look at um, kind of conversations around passive housing and um, uh, sort of eco housing is that every time you see these kinds of examples, they're always seem to be fairly exclusive and not for the masses and very often it's somebody who's got enough money to produce one who lives out in the countryside and actually then will jump in a car to drive five miles to go and get a pint of milk because they live so far away so it's thinking about all of those things it's about how people will operate and function on a day-to-day -day basis to try and reduce that journey we can provide those facilities and amenities uh, a lot closer to home with the, the neighbourhood concept we want to deliver focuses around that. It, it kind of takes a lot of examples from your village hall or village feel, if you like. It's uh, small communities that, that work and live and function together um, and have the, the right kind of amenities nearby. City centres are already, and, and town centres, are already full of amenity, the kind of bigger things that we, that we need with, you know, sort of leisure centres and uh, hospitals and uh, dentists, all those kinds of initial things that we want. We need to bring people back in to use those. And then by bringing that housing, bringing those people back into the town centres, creating those little bubbles to work, to play, to live and eat, and et cetera. Um, you're reducing the journey times, you're reducing the amount of kind of movement of people um, and creating community and local wealth. And then as a result, that's where you'll, you will see those independents popping up because they'll take advantage of the fact you've now got the greater footfall in the town centres. And it sort of answers another question about, are you in a danger of, Sort of recreating the same thing in every town centre and actually I don't think you are because the independents are individual for every town so as those people pop up you will see some really kind of creative probably some similarities but differences in how those towns and communities kind of respond to that, that same demand. I, I, I like that someone described it to me this week as, as a town being authentic and I think that's what mm -hmm. the independent community can bring to itself and bring to the high street it's having that that authenticity. Uh, another question from the audience, which is brilliant because I'm not having to go to any of mine, is Pete uh, has asked, he, he says he 100% agrees with Nikki about getting the public involved and asking what they want, uh, but wonders who will provide it. Has the public sector enough resources to do it? And is will that be attractive enough to investors and to developers? So I guess let's, I'm going to throw that one to, to uh, Lyndon first to say, you know, do you think investors would follow the people or, or do you think they, they need to see something else the pound notes first before they're willing to make that move that might be a harsh question sorry I, I think I think potentially yeah the investment will be there but they need to see that you know they, they can get these people into who want to generate these spaces and also got, they've got the backing from you know the, the local authorities to enable it to happen you know and hopefully with the sort of changes in the planning legislation 
that might make it more easy for for those changes to come about and those people to develop these spaces and and get the inward investment chris i guess this is the same thought to you do you, do you think there's there is enough resource in the public sector to, to do that or do you do you need those proactive private sector partners like capital and centric uh, that richard was talking about there's never enough uh, money in the public sector uh, <laughs> ben but um the government are helping in this regard. We, we're getting, um, we've got a towns deal in Doncaster, uh, which is helping us regenerate parts of the town centre. Uh, we've also got levelling up fund coming in, uh, which is again, um, future high street fund we didn't get, but some of the towns and cities got, which is helping pump prime uh, redevelopment of town centres. Uh, on the back of that, if we get it right, the private sector will follow. And in some senses, the private sector will lead. If you've got a good offer and the private sector know you've got offer, they want to make money and they'll take the lead in coming into town centres if they can see something that they will make money out of. We, we've got a city gateway right next to the, the Doncaster railway station, right on the East Coast main line, pump prime for um, commuter belt. Um, we've got developers claw, crawling all over us to get involved in that um, because they can see the opportunity. Uh, it, it may take um, public private sector partnership to do it, but if you've got the offer right, the private sector developers will come. And, and I guess then the, the other part is, it's not just about the buildings, is it? That's not where this, this renaissance of towns ends. It's about how we keep that going. You can build it and they will come, perhaps only for a short period, but they will yep. come. What, how do you keep that going? I guess, Nikki, you know, you're three, four years down that journey at the Peace Hall now. How do you keep that, that revitalised? And, and, you know, what are the challenges that you might have faced? I think it's simply by what you do within the building. I've, se I've seen, sadly, plenty of white elephants um, whereby the, 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 the capital investment has been well thought about, but the operational part hasn't. It's been sadly wanting. Um, so for us, we, we want to ensure that we always promote this beautiful historic building, um, with, that we are creating really interesting events that make a compelling reason for people not only to visit the Peace Hall, but to visit the borough. Um, so we're seeking to kind of join up our great cultural and historic assets. And we were starting to do that really well prior to the pandemic. We started to get headlines of being an important cultural destination in terms of tourism and in terms of business investment. Um, and on top of that, we are we're also part of the community. You know, we are the piece all that happens to be in Halifax, but this is a much loved community asset. So it's how you continue to resonate with the community, which is probably why you can hear I'm very passionate about it, because most of my traders here, of which we have 43, are from the local community. And our success has also been created by the really hard work of those traders that are constantly thinking about the community and what it might need as much as the really important visitor economy. Um, so for me, it's about having a plan. It's about having a narrative and it's about being joined up um, so that you can really capitalise on all your great assets that you have in an area. In, in Halifax, we, we have greatly benefited in terms of building because we seem to have a number of mill owners who had ego wars. So they would raise the stakes with churches and follies and buildings. And we've inherited a town hall uh, designed by Barry. Uh, we've got a wonderful minster that's been here for many centuries. And I think that when you, you understand how all of those assets can play their role within the, within the community and within the town, if not the wider borough, market towns of Calderdale, you start to have a really interesting, compelling reason for people not only to visit, but to actually live and work here. So some of the effects of the piece, or apart from the economic return, which is 26 million in two years, we've seen big, big employers like Covea, Lloyds and others who have decided to stay here because their staff have said, actually, Calderdale is quite a cool place to live. It offers us a lot in terms of quality of life, in terms of services, amenities. So that they, they, were, they were losing a lot of staff who were having to commute from the cities of Leeds and Manchester, who have been able to buy bigger houses and, and, and go and have improved access to schools and so on. So if you, if you get these things right, I mean, at the end of the day, this is about people. What motivates people to live, work, stay and learn in an area? And if you're making it compelling, you are going to thrive. And that in turn will actually drive inward investment. It kind of starts with how are we best serving the people we serve? You know, are we offering them everything that they need? How else can we 
in, um, attract others to come and enjoy what we enjoy and so on. Um, and actually what I find since I've moved to Yorkshire, people are quite jealous about their county and I understand why. They, you know, I'm an Ofcomden, a local word. Um, I, I'm here because I'm married a Yorkshireman, but you know, it's, a, it's an incredible place to live and work. And we just didn't know, I just didn't know it. It's only when you're here, you, you realize how brilliant it is and what's on offer to you. So how, how can we tell that story to other people? And that narrative for me is so important in terms of any development regeneration. Yes, it's important we save, preserve, you know, do, do all of these things to ensure that the buildings are intact, that the, they have future use. But what are we doing it for? We're actually doing it for people. So it's really important that we do involve people in the narrative, in the journey, so that we can actually understand how we can best serve them. And that in turn creates thriving, vibrant place, you know, and I think that that for me is the secret to this as we go along. Right, I've got I've got two final questions really, and and the first one is is probably aimed at, at Chris, Lyndon, Lyndon, and, and Richard. Um, that obviously, if if we do manage to to hit that 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 nail on the head of creating those vibrant communities, do we think that inward investment will follow it? Do we think that if people are starting to work in local hubs or in local coffee shops, that actually businesses will then think, oh, we need to invest there, whether it's building their own hub or building out? Do we think? that is a case that we get that right inward investment is going to follow chris i'll go to you first um yeah I, I i certainly think so i mean we've been quite lucky during the, the pandemic that uh, our, our interest now in quite levels have gone up uh, particularly from, from out of town and particularly from some of the uh, out of town business parks mainly from uh, online retailers logistics sector because we are a logistics town but we are we are seeing a renaissance in manufacturing and we are seeing manufacturing come in if you create the right Term conditions in a town centre, then inward investment will follow. Um, people, inward investors want to be near success um, and where footfall and people are. So if you put the right conditions in, inward investment will follow. And we're, we're certainly open to capitalise on that as we move forward and start changing the outlook and, and feel of Doncaster town centre. Fantastic. Richard, same to you. Yeah, completely agree. I think you absolutely will, will attract some inward investment. Um, I think people are already looking at it, if I'm totally honest. I think the eyes are already moving away from where the strategies were maybe 18 months ago, 24 months ago, um, and are looking at, yeah, uh, kind of supporting kind of local businesses and, and see that's the way forward. Certainly in the immediate future, it's always a very volatile market, and I'm sure it'll be a completely different thing in a few more years' time, but at the moment, yeah, absolutely. It's all right. It's only getting recorded. You, no one's going to hold you to your words, Richard, I promise. <laughs> Lyndon, I guess to you, you know, do you think that there, could, there is this opportunity for the for the inward investment? And... Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. And I think Richard's right. You know, it's already been looked at. You know, there are people there looking at, you know, opportunities that, you know, they, they can take up with spaces that are empty or, or or facilities that people need. So yeah, I think I think if you, I think in time that will expand more. We'll get a lot more inward investment. Right. So I'm going to give a final closing question to you all, and I'm going to start with you, Dali. I guess. You touched on it at the very start that the planning changes might be a sticking plaster and a short term fix for this. But if we're looking 12, 18 months, maybe even 24 months down the line, what do you hope that the North, England's towns, wherever it is, are seeing? Do you, you know, what do you hope is going to have happened in that period as we build back better, in the words of Boris? Um, so, Ollie, I think I said at the beginning, if that is, um, if you've got to the question, is that. And I personally feel that the planning is a short-term fix in terms of we, we're only going to know the outcome, I think, maybe 12, 18 months down the line, you know, um, as you can see with the conversion from office to residential, for example, there's, there's mixed views in terms of how, uh, what people say about the quality, because some are, some are even the, the extremes, really. Um, I think going forward, um, so then basically time, time will tell. Um, there's so much also wider planning changes as part of the planning bill. Um, and I think planning is one of those things is that there's always you introduce something and there's more questions than results. So you might sort of uh, suggest something, you know, going back to Nikki Cox's side and play, but it doesn't, it, there's, there's always, I mean, it's great for lawyers because it just means that, you know, there's more, there's more work and there's questions around that. But I think, you know, next 18, 12 months will determine whether the current changes um, are actually effective in that it achieves the government's um, overall drive and objective by 
revitalizing town centres and all the rest of it. Um, but I personally think there will be other changes to address the shortcomings of these current changes. That's always the that's always the case with planning. That's that's how I see it at moving forward. Perfect. I guess uh, same question then to you, Richard. You know, in 12, 18 months' time, 24 months' time, do you want to be taking that capital and centric? We're not going to call it a model because that implies it's just the same everywhere else, but that adaptive approach that's going on in Stockport and in Rochdale to other towns across the north, do you think that, that you think there's an appetite there for that? Absolutely. Yeah, I think our aspiration is to, well, we see the recovery, if you like, anyway, over the next few years being in um, the town centres. I think. There's, there's always a market within the cities, uh, but, uh, but I do see massively where we're focusing on looking at kind of other areas, cities as well, but, but absolutely in the surrounding towns and, and areas that otherwise might be neglected. Um, and I think, you know, some of the, the key things I hope, hope to see in the next sort of couple of years is that I think public, public support would be good. I think we're, we're, we all seem to, from what I can read from everybody's conversation, from this conversation, is that we all seem to be on the same page of where things need to go for town and city centres to to recover and, and regenerate. Um, I think that, that there are still so many challenges with city centres with local public because of uh, the, the the kind of image and, and how people perceive their town centres. And I do think talk to Nikki, hearing what Nikki was saying then about all the buildings and things in, in the area, making sure that we are absolutely engaging with with the local community but that they understand that we need to find alternative uses for these places in order to make sure that we can preserve them for, for future generations. Perfect. Chris, same to you, what do you want to see Doncaster doing in 12, 18 months, 24 months time? Make me smile because I'm a Doncaster resident. Well, I, I'm obviously this government funding that's coming through, we, we're spending it in a timely manner, uh, which will allow businesses, creativity, and our footfall to flourish in our town centres. I think we're in a real cusp of opportunity there. Uh, Doncaster is going places. Ben, you, you're aware of that, you're a Doncaster yeah. resident. Uh, and we want people to come and see uh, and, and spend time in our city. And I think we'll get there in the next two years. We are in that cusp of doing something great and we will get there with it. Perfect. Nikki, I guess the same question. I'm going to throw it for you for Halifax. You can do West Yorkshire, actually. We're not going to go one town. You go for the whole of West Yorkshire. For West Yorkshire's towns, what do you want to see over the next 24 months? Well, first of all, I think we do need to achieve devolution um, so that we get that parity of investment in the north. I think that's really key. And let's be more forensic about our investments. Let, let's put the money where it's going to have the most impact and where it's needed the most um, um, and for me, if I could wave a magic wand, I would like to see lots of communities where people are living, working and playing and actually using the space that they live and work in, you know, and, and not just commuting, I think, um, held together by the glue of innovative and dynamic planning um, with a continual kind of thirst and appetite for creating new ventures, new opportunities as we go and being agile enough to respond to that. It's a big ask, I know, Ben, but... You did ask the question. That's what I'd like to see. You know, you've, you've got to you've got to aim for the stars. Otherwise, you know, you might in the worst, you might hit the moon. Uh, <laughs> Lyndon, I guess to you, uh, same question. You know, what what is it you're you're hoping what you'll see, but also perhaps maybe excited about that you could see from from the towns in the north. I, I think what would be good to see for sort of towns and, and suburban areas is you know a lot of the retail spaces that are being left empty pre-COVID because retails are moving out to start to see what those spaces can be used for, whether it's, you know, independents going in there, community hub spaces that can be used for, you know, people who are who, who are home working, you know, maybe the sort of small local business hubs. Um, I think it'd be really interesting to see what those spaces that have sat empty for so long can be used for and, and bring bring life back onto the high street. Fantastic. And with that, we are out of time. Uh, thank you very much to everyone who's watched. Thank you very much for all my panellists for what I feel has been a really interesting discussion. I'm certainly excited about the future of our towns and uh, I'm probably going to have to now go out and test some of these independent traders in Doncaster for lunch. But uh, no, thank you very much. There will be a full write-up of this session on thebusinessdesk.com along with a full video if you would like to re-watch any of it. Thank you to our sponsors, Bevan Britain, and uh, have a fantastic day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.